Now I will discuss a basic new Keynesian model as an extension to the real business cycle model that you can find in previous videos. The treatment uh, in this um, chapter is based on the books by David Romer, 2018, Advanced Macroeconomics, the fifth edition, and Ben Hydra from 2017, Foundations of Modern Macroeconomics, which is the third edition. There are also two journal articles um, on which the presentation is mainly built. The one by Calvo, 1983, Staggered Prices in a Utility Maximizing Framework, uh, published in the Journal of Monetary Economics, and the paper by Cristiano Eichenbaum and Evans, Nominal Rigidities and the Dynamic Effects of a Shock to Monetary Policy, published in the Journal of uh, Political Economy. And the third paper mentioned here is also a famous um, paper in the area of um, New Keynesian models. It's the model of the European Central Bank, basically by Smets and Wouters, an estimated dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model for the euro area, uh, published in the Journal of the European Economic Association. To set the stage for the New Keynesian model, basically recall from the real business cycle model that there was no role for monetary policy, basically. So the people didn't hold money in the first place. There was no motive to hold money. And even if they held money to some extent, then the perfectly flexible prices and wages in the real business cycle model would have implied neutrality of monetary policy at all points in time. So if there happens something to the economy that would affect um, uh, optimal prices of uh, firms, then firms would instantaneously set different prices, wages would adjust instantaneously, and actually uh, nominal shocks would not affect the real variables uh, whatsoever. However, we know it's rather obvious in reality that people hold cash, and it's also empirically well established that monetary policy has real effects in the short run, in the long run, more money is uh, more neutral. So there must be some rigidities, stickiness of prices and wages that explain why monetary shocks can affect real variables in the economy. What are the reasons why prices and wages might be sticky? There are many. And the most important ones that are usually mentioned in the literature are that uh, contracts with fixed wages and prices usually extend over longer periods and therefore they cannot be adjusted instantaneously by law, basically. So that would be one channel by which rigidities enter these models. Another is that adjusting prices is costly to some extent. So the so-called menu costs. The idea behind this is that if you are a restaurant and you change the prices every day, you have to print a new menu and that entails certain costs. But in reality, of course, that's um, much broader. There are also time costs associated with changing prices um, very frequently and so on and so forth. And therefore, price setters typically set their prices for longer periods. Imperfect information might also play a role. So if you don't know what the optimal price is or if it's just... Um, possible to say that within a certain range that it might also be uh, better to keep the uh, price fixed in the short run and adjust it later on. But there are many more such uh, reasons and uh, here in this chapter we will mostly be agnostic about the source of the rigidity and follow the famous Calvo pricing model by Calvo 1983 that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, where basically the idea behind that is that it is a shortcut formulation to capture these rigidities in the sense that uh, firms can stochastically adjust their prices at a certain point in time so they get a, a certain signal whether or not they are allowed to change their price in a certain period. And this shortcut formulation is easy to implement and also easy to interpret and therefore it um, has become very important in the literature. Now, what we typically have in the literature is a real business cycle model that is augmented by the new Keynesian elements. So the new Keynesian elements would mainly apply in the short run, where the prices are fixed, and then you can have the effect that nominal shocks affect uh, real activities in the economy. But then in the medium to long run, the economy converges back to the um, long run balance growth equilibrium, to the steady state, and uh, the nominal shocks die out to some extent. So we have neutrality of money in the long run and um, non-neutrality of money in the 
short run. Now the presentation here actually abstracts from the medium to short uh, to long run, so we don't have the real business cycle framework here in the background. And this can be justified because typically the new Keynesian model is solved for deviations from the steady states anyway. So actually one would abstract um, from the trend and just focus on the fluctuations. And that's also what we do here. Now, uh, the basic assumption that um, we have uh, and that also Roma follows in his book is that there is again a utility function over time, starts at time zero and goes to infinity. Beta is the discount factor. Uh, it is smaller than one because we uh, value utility today much more than we value a certain utility in the distant future. And then <clears throat> utility is derived by three different uh, variables actually here. The first is consumption as we had it according to an isoelastic utility function. So utility increases with consumption. The second element is new. So that's um, that also money holdings increase utility. And the rationale behind that is that uh, it reduces uh, the amount of transaction costs that you have. So if you don't hold money, you would have to go to the bank uh, for every transaction you have. And um, that would, of course, lead to huge time costs. But if you um, hold money, then you can avoid uh, much of these time costs and would not have to go to the bank that uh, frequently. And the shortcut formulation to capture this is to write money holdings into the utility function. So we would have nominal money holdings um, denoted by MT. The price level is PT, so the ratio of the two is uh, real money holdings. And again, we have an isoelastic utility function, so utility increases with the money that an individual holds. There are other ways of modeling that, uh, for example, the cash in advance constraint, where money would not show up in the utility function, but in the budget constraints, so it would be a restriction that you can only pay for something with money and not with bonds or any other savings that you have. And also in this case, households would want to hold money. In the end, it leads to the similar um, structure, actually, so it's isomorphic. And since it's more frequently used in the literature, the money in the utility function approach uh, Roma followed it, uh, and I also followed Roma here. And then the third part is a labor supply again. Now it's not written down as in the real business cycle model as leisure, but as the inverse as labor supply, and therefore it shows up with a negative utility effect, um, where B actually captures the, in, the, the disutility of labor or the inverse of the preference for leisure, actually. Now, what I do differently uh, to the book in the, by David Roma is that I write minus one in the numerator of all these expressions, and that is to circumvent problems that arise where we have the limiting cases when theta goes to one, or nu goes to one, or gamma goes to zero. The reason is that if you have these limiting cases, that's the logarithmic utility function, but uh, you have to derive it by relying on L'Hopital's rule. And if you do not have minus one in the numerator, then you would not get an expression for the limiting case that is zero divided by zero, and you could not strictly apply the uh, rule of L'Hopital. So therefore I write it in this way, which is mathematically um, correct, and it does not affect the first order conditions whatsoever. Now, at the beginning, we abstract from expectations for the moment, uh, and later on, we introduce um, expectations when it comes to uh, introducing future variables and uncertainty. How does the budget constraint look like? Here, the main um, yeah, uh, simplification is that we abstract from capital holdings because we focus on the short run and we abstract from this medium run phenomenon for the moment. Of course, in a fully fledged model, where you have the real business cycle part in the background, uh, you would have capital accumulation as well. Now, the consequence of this assumption is that total wealth or assets consist of money and bonds only. So you cannot accumulate capital, but you would either save by holding money, which does not earn an interest uh, payment or by uh, buying bonds and bonds earn a nominal interest rate denoted by IT. This structure implies that holding money comes with a opportunity cost because there are no interest payments on money while you could earn interest payments when you hold uh, bonds. So holding money is costly 
on the one hand, but on the other hand, you have the utility of holding money for transactions and yeah, the optimizing households balance of these two things as they do with consumption, with the utility that is derived from consumption, but that reduces, of course, the budget that is available for other um, goods. Then we can write down the budget constraint where you would have a dynamic uh, budget constraint where assets at time t plus one are basically assets carried over from the previous period. So that's uh, money holdings that do not earn an interest rate or assets which would earn an interest rate, um, other assets basically, or one minus uh, IT. And these other assets are there because we subtract money from them again. So all the bonds basically that are held, uh, they earn an interest um, IT and of course they also um, carried over to the next period. And then of course savings, which is a total wage income, W is the wage, L is labor supply, so that's total wage income. And if we subtract from that the total consumption expenditures, which is consumption multiplied by its price, then we get savings. And savings also earn an interest um, IT, of course. Now, wages and consumption expenditures are measured at the beginning of the period, and therefore they are multiplied already by the interest rate. Now we can summarize all that by writing down the Lagrangian function, which is the utility function here, plus the Lagrange multiplier times the constraint, where in the constraint we bring assets at period t plus 1 to the right hand side, so we subtract uh, here. And then we have four control variables basically. So households can choose consumption, nominal money holdings, which uh, determines real money holdings for the uh, inflation rate that prevails. Uh, then assets at time t plus 1 are basically also determined by this um, structure and by the consumption savings choice and how much I hold in terms of money and how much I hold in terms of um, uh, bonds is then determined uh, by, by the, the corresponding choice. And uh, labor supply, LT, that's the fourth um, control variable. Now we can solve for the choices in this uh, framework. And here we just use the theorem of Lagrange. You can also write it down, of course, uh, by means of hamilton jacobi bellman approach. Uh, but here we just do the simple way of uh, writing it down because we don't have strategic interactions and so on. So the first order conditions with respect to consumption and assets at time t plus one would be as written down here. So that's the derivative of the utility function with respect to consumption. Now we see here that um, uh, if we take the derivative with respect to consumption, one minus theta comes down from the exponent. It cancels off with one minus theta from the denominator. The minus one term drops out because it's a constant for the optimization and we still have b to the uh, beta to the power of t here from this uh, expression and that's uh, exactly what we have here and the exponent is reduced by um, one so the minus theta prevails from here and then we have consumption also in the budget constraint here so we would have minus lambda times pt times one minus it and that's exactly what we have here and if we reformulate it we can isolate the lagrange multiplier lambda as this expression here divided by this expression uh, here so that's the first first order condition. The second first order condition with respect to assets at time t plus 1 is then the next equation. So if we take the derivative with respect to assets at time t plus 1, then what we see here is that assets um, show up basically at two time periods. So here it's straightforward to see what happens with assets at time t plus 1. So we have lambda um, t here from this derivative, but we also have assets at time t here. And this term shows up in the sum for t plus 1. So then we would have beta to the power of um, t plus 1, actually, multiplied by lambda at time t plus 1. And um, that would multiply with a t. So um, uh, when we take the derivative, we have beta to the power of t plus 1 times lambda uh, at time t plus 1. And we have uh, the interest rate, actually, from here. So i at time t plus 1. So that's this expression here, minus lambda is equal to zero. That's the second first order condition with respect to choices of a t plus one. And now we can put these two together to derive the 
central equation again that we always have in these types of models and that we also have in the new Keynesian model, the Euler equation, or as it is also called the Keynes-Ramsey rule. And as we will see here, it includes inflation as well. And that was an aspect that we didn't have so far. So what we can do here is we can plug in lambda from here into this expression, and we can plug in lambda t plus 1, which is just this expression here, iterated one period forward so that we have um, beta to the power of t plus 1, c at the time t plus 1 minus um, to the power of minus theta, the prices at the time t plus 1 and interest rate at time t plus 1, and plug it into the left-hand side here. And then we get this expression where we see that a lot drops out. So 1 plus uh, the interest rate is here in the, denom in the numerator and in the denominator. It drops out. Then um, here we have beta to the power of t plus 1. Here beta to the power of t. If we divide by beta to the power of t, we get um, only one beta that remains here. And if we bring pt plus 1 to the right-hand side, we have here an expression for inflation, namely pt uh, plus 1 divided by pt minus 1 is the inflation rate. So if we add plus 1, then that's exactly the expression that we would get here. And if we put everything together then and isolate consumption on the left-hand side and all the rest on the right-hand side, then we would get the, the growth factor of optimal consumption, as we also had it in many previous chapters, but there uh, we had it without inflation. And that would be a function of the discount factor beta. So the more uh, patient people are, the, um, the higher would be the growth factor of consumption, because that means people would save and ceteris paribus consume more in the future. And that leads to a steeper consumption path. It depends on the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. Um, the higher it is, which is 1 over theta, where theta is the coefficient of relative risk aversion. The higher the elasticity of intertemporal substitution is, the more willing individuals are to shift consumption over time. So for a given interest rate, they would be more willing to save. And then we have the interest rate, of course, that would increase ceteris paribus consumption in the future because people would save more and would earn more interest on their savings and therefore be able to consume more in the future. But it would decrease in the inflation rate, of course, because that's the nominal interest rate. And for a given inflation rate, of, uh, for, for a given nominal interest rate, a higher inflation rate, of course, implies a lower real interest rate. And of course, for the choice to shift re uh, consumption over time, it's the real interest rate that matters to the households. So that's the first core equation the consumption Euler equation or the Keynes Ramsey rule. And we will see that we can use this rule basically to derive the new Keynesian IS curve. To get to the new Keynesian IS curve, we take logarithms of the Keynes-Ramsey rule. So we have here the logarithm of consumption at time t plus 1 minus the logarithm of consumption at time t on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have our 1 over theta that comes down from the exponent times the logarithm of beta plus the logarithm of 1 plus the nominal interest rate minus the logarithm of 1 plus the inflation rate that we have in here. And then we can make use of the approximations that we have um, that uh, the logarithm of 1 plus the nominal interest rate is um, equivalent to the nominal interest rate and the logarithm of 1 plus inflation is equivalent to the rate of inflation for small rates of inflation and, uh, int uh, and the interest rate. And then we define the real interest rate as the difference between the nominal interest rate and inflation. And then we can rewrite this equation here. And we also isolate consumption on the left-hand side at the time t. We bring consumption um, at time t plus 1 to the other side, basically, and merge it with uh, this term here. So that would show up with a negative sign then here. And logarithm of consumption at time t is on the right-hand side. And then we just uh, flip it. And uh, then here we would have uh, the nominal um, interest rate minus the rate of inflation. So we have the real interest rate then here according to uh, these uh, definitions. And we still have the logarithm of beta uh, in here. Now, <clears throat> the logarithm of uh, beta is close to zero because beta is close to one as the discount factor. So we can um, drop it out. And then we uh, make use of the fact that this economy does not have any capital. 
So total production implies uh, that it is equal to total consumption. So we don't have capital accumulation, we don't have a government, we don't have an open economy. So therefore output is equal to consumption and we can plug this in here. So we have the logarithm of output at time t is equal to the logarithm of output in the future. That will, will play an important element later on when we introduce expectations in the model. And uh, it has a negative relation with the real interest rate here. And basically what we have here is a new Keynesian IS curve that exhibits a negative relationship between output and the interest rate that we could, um, yeah, that we could draw in an ISLM diagram accordingly. The interpretation is straightforward. An increase in the interest rate raises saving and lowers consumption and therefore output. Now saving is here in the form of bonds. Uh, so therefore consumption is reduced, but there is no investment and no capital accumulation because otherwise um, you would, could have a compensating effect. In a model with physical capital, however, an increase in the interest rate on bonds would also uh, decrease investments and therefore um, lower output further. And with international trade, it could also be that an increase in the interest rate raises the demand for home assets, which would lead to an appreciation. And afterwards, exports would fall and imports rise, and this would lower output uh, even further. So this here is this effect, this IS curve that we get does not depend on the assumptions that we have a closed economy or no capital. They would rather be uh, reinforced if we allowed for these elements. Now, this was the first main equation of this simplified New Keynesian model, where we do not yet have expectations. They will be introduced later on. But now we come to the second important equation, and that's derived from the first order condition with respect to nominal money holdings, and that will result in the New Keynesian LM curve, basically. Now, with respect to money holdings, taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to money holdings, we see that money holdings show up here. So 1 minus nu comes down from the uh, exponent. It cancels off with uh, the denominator here. We have um, the real money holdings then uh, within uh, parentheses. And we have to take the inner derivative because we take the derivative with respect to nominal money holdings, and that would be 1 over the price level Pt. And from here, we still have the discount factor beta to the power of t. That's exactly the expression that we have uh, here. And then uh, the money holdings also show up in the budget constraint with a negative um, sign, and uh, it's multiplied by the Lagrange multiplier, so we get this expression here. And we can bring that to the right hand side and plug in the expression that we got for the Lagrange multiplier in the first first order condition. And that would then lead to this expression here. We see that the price level from here and uh, from here drops uh, out. Then uh, we isolate here on the left hand side uh, the real money holdings. So we bring this exponent to the right hand side. So we have then everything um, to the power of 1 over mu. We bring also the discount factor to them, um, although that cancels off with uh, this discount factor here, basically, so that cancels out. And we have here the nominal interest rate um, in parentheses and here output. <clears throat> so that means that money demand on the left hand side, so real money holdings, increase with output. So if output increases, we have an increase in uh, money demand by households. That's due to the transaction needs. And we know this from the standard LM curve from introductory macroeconomics. And it decreases with the nominal interest rate because that's the opportunity cost of money holdings. And if the opportunity cost of money holdings uh, rise, then of course, Ceteris Paribus households would want to hold less money. So this is the second central equation of this new Keynesian um, uh, model here, the new Keynesian LM curve. To establish that it really has this um, positive relationship between output and the real interest rate, we can write it down in this way. So then we would have output on the left hand side isolated and on the right hand side we have money holdings and an expression for the uh, real interest rate where we substitute it out for, for the nominal interest rate 
uh, from the previous expression and then uh, added uh, inflation. So then we have uh, the real interest rate showing up in this term here. If we take the derivative with respect to the real interest rate, what we get is that the real interest rate shows up in this term here. So we have to take the derivative, which means that the exponent comes down. The exponent is this expression, which is negative. And the exponent is reduced by minus 1 here. And then we have to take the inner derivative. And that's um, where we have to apply the quotient rule because um, the real interest rate shows up in the numerator and in the denominator. And if we do that, then what survives is the negative term from the quotient rule divided by the denominator to the power of uh, 2. And this negative sign, therefore, is due to the quotient rule. So we have a negative sign here and a negative sign here. And the two um, cancel off each other, and we have a positive expression here. So indeed, the relationship between the real interest rate and output is positive. Um, basically, uh, this is if uh, the real interest rate increases, then a given amount of real money holdings would only prevail if also the transaction needs rise. So if consumption increases, which in our model implies that also output increases one for one. And that's the reason here why we have this positive relationship in this uh, new Keynesian LM curve. Now, for completeness, we also look at the first order condition for labor supply, although we only need it later on. So we take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to LT. So that means what we would get is um, here uh, this uh, beta to the power of T uh, multiplied by minus B. Then we have gamma coming down from the exponent, cancelling off with uh, this gamma here. And then what we have is here is LT to the power of gamma minus 1 from here. And here we have um, lambda T times uh, WT multiplied by 1 plus IT. And that's exactly what we have um, uh, here as the first order condition with respect to uh, labor supply, optimal labor supply uh, of households. Then we again use the expression for lambda from the first first order condition and plug it in here. We bring the term to the right hand side and we again use that consumption is equal to output and also in equilibrium here because we don't have any other production factor and just simply assume a linear production function, we have that output increases one for one with labor. So consumption is equal to output is equal to labor. So we can plug um, this in here. We can uh, substitute out for uh, labor supply LT by uh, output of the economy. <clears throat> then we can uh, simplify. Uh, this expression uh, here further, so the beta uh, t drops out again and so on, and can isolate the real wage rate here on the left-hand side, and that would then be uh, a positive relationship um, here with um, uh, b, and uh, would have a relationship with output here, where the exponent has a theta plus gamma minus uh, 1. Basically, so that's um, the relationship that we can derive between the real wage rate and output, where output is determined by labor supply. So that's the reason why this relationship um, prevails. And then we can take the logarithm of that to uh, that's for later reference when we use this again, and we denote lowercase uh, by lowercase letters uh, variables that are in logs. So we get here the wage rate minus the uh, price level on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we get this uh, B term here. And if we take the log, we just denote it here by lowercase b. The term here from the exponent comes down. And we have here per capita uh, the logarithm of uh, output here, y. And we denote this term in parentheses here by phi. That's an equation that we need later on. Now we have two main ingredients, the new Keynesian IS curve and the new Keynesian LM curve for this very simplified new Keynesian model without expectations yet. But we can nevertheless use them for a thought experiment that we all know from introductory macroeconomics, where we assume that prices are fixed. So the price level P is equal to P uh, bar and the inflation rate is uh, zero. 
As a consequence, nominal and real interest rates coincide. And now we consider a one period expansion of money supply. So the central bank pumps money into the economy. Uh, but MT plus one and uh, future output and so on remain as in the initial situation. Now, what would happen in this case is that as money supply increases, nominal money supply increases since the price level is fixed, that would um, lead to an increase in real money supply, real money holdings, which would put uh, downward pressure on the interest rate, but by contrast, upward pressure on uh, consumption, basically. Uh, for the future, and that would uh, lead to an increase in output because we have this um, uh, situation where uh, everything that is consumed has to be produced, so yt is equal to ct, so also output would increase. So in such a thought experiment um, with fixed prices, we would indeed get a real effect of monetary policy. With fully flexible prices, we would not get this effect because then if um, nominal money supply increases, we would just have that the price level increases and real money holdings would actually stay constant. <clears throat> and that would be the case in the real business cycle model. And we won't have um, any uh, real effects uh, on, on output. We can also illustrate this graphically. So we're very well familiar with uh, all of that. So we can draw the interest rate on the um, vertical axis, output on the horizontal axis. We draw in the IS curve, which is downward sloping. So if the interest rate is lower, we would have higher uh, income or output. And if the interest rate is higher, we would have lower output um, and income. Here, consumption would also be lower. And then we can draw the LM curve, where it is exactly the opposite, as we've seen previously. So there is a positive relationship between output and the real interest rate. Um, because if um, output is high, there is a high demand for transactions, and that would lead to a high interest rate and um, vice versa when output is low. Now the two intersect, and where the two intersect, we would have the equilibrium <coughs> level of output at the equilibrium level of the real interest rate. That's denoted by old because now we have this policy shift where the central bank increases money supply, which pushes the LM curve downwards, basically. And we have a new intersection between uh, the old IS curve that didn't change and the new LM curve here at the higher output level, Y star new, and the lower level of the real interest rate, R star new. So that would be the standard story that we know from the simple ISLM model that you know from introductory macroeconomics. And here we see that the same story would hold also in the dynamic specification and the micro-founded specification that we've just derived here. Now you might think after all the fuss, we are now back at the basic ISLM model. So uh, why should we do that? The reason is that we now have a micro-foundation for the ISLM model. Uh, it is based on household uh, choices. And as we will see next, it includes a forward-looking term. So future output is present in the uh, IS curve. So therefore, if we introduce expectations in the model, we will have um, a dynamic structure where people take future developments and expectations on future developments into account in their uh, decision today. And that will have repercussions on uh, the equilibrium, basically. And that is also the second point here. The ISLM model that we have now is dynamic and thus suited to a dynamic analysis. And you might have always wondered with the ISLM model in the standard introductory macroeconomics courses, why they, which are basically static, there are no dynamic variables there, why there are always these um, dynamic evolutions that you uh, analyzed, because strictly speaking, the model was uh, static. But now, uh, this micro foundation, this dynamic micro foundation, shows actually why such dynamic analysis can be made. Now, to complete this basic model, we will now, in a first step, postulate a Phillips curve, which describes then aggregate supply in the economy. And we will modify the LM equation to account better for how actual monetary policies are conducted nowadays. So central banks do not set money supply anymore, but they target or they 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 change they they affect interest rates their policies. And um, there can be rules by which they set the interest rate, such as a Taylor rule, as we will see later on. 
And finally, afterwards, when we after we've discussed this simple model, um, we will then also derive a micro-founded new Keynesian Phillips curve. Actually, that is then uh, that substitutes then later on for the postulated Phillips curve that we have at the beginning.